So I guess right, we're well, okay. Yeah, yeah I don't I see anything, okay. but go, yeah, go ahead. I think we're okay. Um, okay, so welcome everybody um, to Green Neighborhoods, a plan for the South Baltimore 7. This presentation, um, as you just heard, is the culmination of a studio course in the community planning program at the University of Maryland, and we'll be talking tonight about how to use green infrastructure as a catalyst for re revitalizing uh, Baltimore's middle branch neighborhoods. We all know that, especially in the middle of a global pandemic, access to green space, outdoor activities, and healthy food is critical. Um, but it's also important to note that green infrastructure can make housing more sustainable, facilitate greener modes of transportation, and energize commercial areas. Um, so to give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about tonight, here's our agenda. First, we'll discuss why green infrastructure is a powerful tool um, to revitalize this part of Baltimore, kind of why are we doing this project. Second, we'll discuss some highlights of current conditions in the SB7 neighborhoods and recap our inventory and analysis. Um, third, we will walk you for, through our concept plan. Fourth, we'll discuss strategies, programs, and our implementation plan. Um, and finally, we'll talk about the ever important financing and funding involved. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A session that David will, will lead. Uh, next. Uh -oh. There we go. Okay. So who are the SB7 neighborhoods and where are they? Um, you'll see them all on this map. They lie at the very southern end of Baltimore City, um, adjoining Baltimore and Anne Arundel counties to the west and the middle branch to the east. Um, these neighborhoods include Westport, Mount Winans, and Lakeland in blue, Cherry Hill in green, Brooklyn and Curtis Bay in orange, plus Port Covington um, there to the east across the middle branch from the rest of the neighborhoods. You'll see that we've grouped these neighborhoods together into these clusters or sub areas um, to kind of allow us to streamline our data analysis and consider the, the areas in greater granularity. Um, and now I will hand it over to Daniela, who will help us answer the question, why green infrastructure? Thanks, Anna. So green infrastructure is a network of natural areas, open spaces, and stormwater infrastructure that uses or mimics natural processes, essentially nature integrated into the built environment. These networks help conserve natural ecosystem values and functions, sustain clean water and air, and provide a wide array of benefits to people and wildlife. As you can see, the benefits of green infrastructure range from the physical and environmental to social and economic and produce benefits like flooding mitigation, reducing stormwater runoff, and co-benefits such as alleviating urban heat islands, mitigating the impacts of climate change, and creating green jobs. Our plan aims to thoughtfully introduce green infrastructure and its many social benefits while considering the interconnecting community of systems needed to make it happen. That means aligning green infrastructure strategies with housing needs, workforce development, transportation policy, public health, and education, as well as identifying and recommending quick wins and providing a roadmap for activation projects that can show uh, value early. So although green infrastructure has many benefits, it can also bring what researchers called green displacement, in which new investments can drive up housing prices and create an influx of wealthier and often white residents. Equitable implementation is therefore crucial to our plan, and we work to ensure that any infrastructure investments in the SB7 benefit the existing community through specific policies and programs. I'll now pass it on to my classmate, Catherine, to talk more about the existing plans and uh, initiatives. Thanks, Daniela. Throughout the process of developing our plan, we've looked into 21 plans in total. It was important for us to see what has already been done or planned for. You will hopefully be able to see that we've incorporated ideas and suggestions of existing plans into our recommendations. We're hoping that our plan will help validate and carry forward previous plans, initiatives, and goals, as well as integrate new ideas throughout the SB7 as a whole. Next. This map helps visualize which areas of the SB7 had previously been planned for, where these plans overlapped, and also identify which areas had been left from plans, such as Lakeland, Mount Winans, and Curtis Bay. Overlaying plan boundaries and comparing the issues raised by these many plans was a valuable tool. Next, please. 
There are three major already planned or existing initiatives that we'd like to quickly highlight. Firstly, the bounds of the South Baltimore Gateway Park Partnership, which includes all SB7 neighborhoods, except for Brooklyn, Curtis Bay, and Port Covington, is a designated community benefit district, which makes local impact funds from the Horseshoe Casino explicitly available for the purpose of reinvestment. The upcoming Port Covington development is a huge potential asset for the SB7, offering new jobs and opportunities, as well as green open spaces. And lastly, the proposed Middle Branch waterfront development will introduce extensive new green space access and likely lead to other development opportunities. Though this does have potential negative impacts, such as displacement, that will need to be addressed. Next. We've received valuable input from approximately 24 individuals through both stakeholder interviews, as well as meetings with professionals during our class time. There was a wide range of people we interacted with who offered varying insights into many issues relating to the SB7. Major themes brought to light in our stakeholder interviews are listed here on the slide and were greatly influential in the development of the strategies we're proposing for implementation in the SB7. Now I'll pass it on to Maria, who will begin our inventory and analysis section. Thanks, Catherine. So coupled with the information Catherine has just briefed you, the team collected, read, and analyzed a numerous amount of additional data. Shown here is a list of some of the categories of data inventoried, as well as some of the analytical points developed in order to create an, an approach to, a, to the plan. Due to the extensive amount of information, we will share a brief overview of several data points in the next few slides. The report will contain more detail on these categories. Next. Here you see data analysis of several demographic factors relative to the three sub areas. I would like to point out three things. First, median household income. Take note of the incomes for the year 2018. Cherry Hill contains the lowest median income overall, and when comparing the sub-area average of about 34,000, we see it only accounts for about 70% of the city average, 30% of the state average, and about 50% of the national average. Additionally, take note of the last median income listed. This is the 2018 national average for family households maintained by women with no spouse. During our mid-semester presentation, we reported that more than 70% of SB7 households were female-headed. Shifting your attention to the right of the slide, a second factor to note is the percentage of children living below poverty. We took the three percentages and calculated an average of 47.8% of SB7 children who live below the poverty line. This percentage surpasses both the city average as well as the national average of 16.2%. Lastly, the lower right-hand corner of this slide, we see life expectancies within SB7, all of which fall below the city, both the city and national averages. Next slide. Here are several other data points we researched. First, transportation and mobility data gave us a path in understanding how the residents of SB7 traverse the area. We see most people drive to work, even though 30% of households are without cars. And of those who do use public transportation, 89% are bus riders. Next, we explored data relative to Baltimore's digital divide. Here you see the percentage of those SB7 households with no internet. While these percentages are aligned to other parts of Baltimore City, that have limited or no internet broadband connection, we discovered a significant difference just south of Curtis Bay in Anne Arundel County, where only 5% of those households have no internet. Next, the team wanted to understand where people work. Here you see a, a fair number of people that work within and outside their place of residence, yet no one commutes into SB7 for work. Last point are the skill levels of SB7 workers shown on the bottom right. As you can see, the highest percentage belongs to those of low skilled workers. This is a type of data that assisted our team in developing our concept plan. Next. 
Michael Dorsey. Join the meeting. Existing green stormwater infrastructure includes a network of parks and open spaces, sporadic areas of concentrated tree canopy, and a preliminary network of trails and bike paths. Critical flood areas impact existing infrastructure and impede safe connection between neighborhoods. Major areas of flood concern to note include the area around Gwynn's Falls Tr River to the north of Westport, in the area around the Patapsco River between Cherry Hill and Brooklyn, including along the bridges that connect the neighborhoods. Our report will contain a full set of site maps which will depict a full planning analysis. Next. The next two slides depict both issues and opportunities for the SB7 area. While there is much information noted here, I will keep it simple by identifying some noteworthy issues applicable to our concept plan. First, we see barriers in isolation from Baltimore City via man-made and natural barriers such as I-95, the rail line, and Gwynn's Falls, all of which collectively separate SB7 from the rest of the city. Next, disconnectivity within SB7 is another issue. Here we see pockets of commercial, institutional, and educational uses peppered throughout the area, preventing these neighborhoods from being unified. Another issue with respect to disconnectivity is accessibility. Accessibility to some of these service areas is difficult for people without cars, the elderly, parents with small children, and other pedestrians looking to access not only these services, but also some public transit areas such as bus stops. Overall, these issues stem from things such as land use, as shown by the amount of industrial zoned areas surrounded by residential areas or surrounding the residential areas and incomplete streets, making it difficult for people and bicyclists to travel. Also prevailing winds from the Northwest traveling through industrial areas make it all the more important to encourage more nature nodes and tree planting. Finally, it is important to note that while these issues are issues, they can also be opportunities, which we will see in the next slide. Next. Similar to the issues map, there is much happening here by way of opportunities, which is a good thing because we see much potential in the SB7. I will be brief because the data analysis allows the team to develop the concept plan, which you, you will see next. So I will only point out a few things. First, the term green potential. It's broad and it will be made clearer in our concept plan. But here we see this as any number of potential elements such as complete streets, green infrastructure, nature nodes, tree canopy, and urban gardens. Next, to address disconnectivity, we initially begin by identifying activity hubs to show the clusters of service areas to include the proposed activity hub for Port Covington. Each hub allows the team to address the notion of connectivity to one another as well as to existing parks, community centers, and of course the waterfront. The large port auto industry area to the east is just that and assists Baltimore in being the number one auto port in the nation, so the team felt it was important to embrace it. Both Masonville Cove and Reedbird Island are ecological and environmental entities that should be expanded upon to support future citizen science, education, and workforce development opportunities. Likewise, the future development at Port Covington has the potential of becoming an important SB7 partner. Lastly, land use limitation of industrially zoned areas within SB7, as well as features such as the water taxi, the Charm City Circulator, and historic designated sites are other potentials for SB7 connectivity but have not been fully addressed in this plan. However, the team felt it was important to identify these potential, future, identify these uh, for potential future use by city officials and stakeholders. I will now turn this over to Shane to present our concept plan. Thanks, Maria. The concept plan is part of a complementary two-part strategy that includes both a physical concept plan that identifies specific locations for key interventions, followed by an implementation plan with policy and programmatic recommendations to support equitable neighborhood investment. 
we designed the physical concept plan and the implementation plan to work together to achieve these goals. Chris and I are going to start off by talking you through the physical plan. And next. The physical concept plan we developed for the SB7 neighborhoods is a green infrastructure plan that focuses on connectivity through green networks. Based on the information we gathered through inventory and analysis and stakeholder interviews, we identified strategic locations to implement various greening and open space solutions, as well as targeted areas for development opportunities. This plan is meant to create a network that ties the residential neighborhoods of the SB7 into the new Middle Branch waterfront development and improve connectivity with the surrounding region. I will talk through several of the overarching physical strategies we are proposing for the SB7, and then we will take a closer look at some specific recommendations for neighborhood sub areas. The green dotted lines represent a network of complete green streets that help knit together a sequence of parks and open spaces of varied size and function and improve walkable connections between the neighborhoods. Key connections are made to link together areas that we identified as activity hubs, which we are defining as clusters of community assets. Connecting these hubs is a critical component of our strategy because it will enable the neighborhoods to share access to important resources and expand the impact of local investments to mutually benefit the residents of all the neighborhoods in the SB7. We identified specific sites for key interventions, including parks, development opportunities, and special programming for the Mount Auburn Cemetery, all of which we discuss in great detail in our report. Uh, in the upcoming slides, however, Chris and I will be taking you through select examples of specific site interventions and green space typologies as we examine the neighborhood sub areas at a more granular level. And next. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the sub area plans show where we have identified ideal locations for various intervention types, which we represented on the map by a color coded classification system. The first sub area we are going to look at includes Lakeland, Mount Winans, and Westport. Major intervention types in this sub area include complete green streets along major connectivity corridors a sequence of nature, community, neighborhood, and pocket parks, a deconstructed urban farm, and a large community development opportunity site in Mount Winans. All of these interventions are discussed in detail in our report, but due to time constraints, we will not be going through all of them tonight. We selected a few interventions from each area to share, and I'm now gonna hand it over to Chris to go through those. Okay, thank you, Shane. Next. First, I would like to start by showing you our kit of parts. First, we have paving and planters, pervious paving and planters to absorb rainwater. Second, we have silver cells, provide soil volume to trees, which help enrich their mature size. Third, we have better bus stops. We have bike lanes. Um, six, we have five uh, through uh, eight, seven. We have three categories of streets. We have primary corridors, commercial corridors, and residential corridors. And last, we have path. Next. In order to achieve our goals, which are prioritize equity, improve public health, jumpstart local reinvestment, and increase connectivity, we must look at the streets at a pedestrian level. Our first example is Hollins Ferry Road. This corridor is very important because it connects Patasco Avenue all the way to Westport. Uh, next. This uh, Hollins Ferry has good sidewalks, but lacks street canopy. Therefore, we propose street planters and street parking together to maximize the use of space. Next. Our second example is a bus stop located in Waterview Street. This corridor is important because it connects Cherry Hill with Westport, but the pedestrian conditions are very, very difficult. Next. There are bus stops, but there are no sidewalks. So therefore, we propose creating a bus stop and connecting it to the sidewalk on the other side. This way, pedestrian can get to their destination safely. Next. Our third example is Shell Road. As you know, Curtis Bay does not have access to the waterfront. This corridor is important because it connects Curtis Bay to Masonville Cove, 
and it gives access to the waterfront. Next, Shell Road does not have any sidewalks. Therefore, we propose a path for pedestrian and bicycles using the space within the right of way. Using the city's trees and flower trees will turn this rough road into a wonderful experience. Next, our fourth example is Pennington Avenue. This corridor is a commercial corridor, but right now it's not as powerful as it could be. It is one way, it is wide, and it has priority on freight. Next. So therefore, we propose narrow industry to accommodate trees, street parking. We also give more space to bus stops and overall create a walkable environment. Next, our last example is Patapsco Avenue. This corridor connects Curtis Bay, a business hub in Brooklyn, and it takes us back to Westport. Next. This is a wide street having parking on both sides and with priority on freight. Therefore, we propose trees and parking on, on one side and bike lane on the other side. This way, we narrow the street and provide protection to pedestrians. Next. In summary, the physical concept plan creates a loop that unites the SB7 region and it provides green corridors that are connecting corridor hubs in the region. Now I turn it over to Daniela, who will talk about strategies, programs, and implementation. So what strategies and programs will support the implementation of this concept plan? And what potential partnerships, phasing and funding, financing strategy will help um, support it? So we recognize that our sub-area concept designs require large investments that may not be immediately um, feasible. So we recommend an iterative project delivery model. This model focuses on breaking ground on smaller scale projects early that could be iterated upon and show community value early on. The demonstration projects introduce and explain to the community the concept and these can be entirely community led. A pilot then scales the demonstration up by testing its effectiveness. This step requires greater involvement by the city and other local organizations. Inter interim design expands upon the pilots by installing semi-durable materials. Changes are possible, but is intended to remain in place until the longer term capital upgrades are possible. So we're using a tactical urbanism strategy early on to test out the lower impact recommendations and also create ways to engage the community in the collaborative design process. The expectation is that these projects can be refined based on performance. So our plan recommends a series of outcome measures to track to help evaluate demonstration and pilots. So we developed this roadmap for the phasing of the plan. You'll see that it highlights major milestones to grow short-term actions into long-term inter interventions. Some key milestones include identifying a plan steward, securing uh, strategic partnerships. My classmate Luke will speak to some of the potential partnerships in the coming sections. Securing initial uh, funds for the tactical urban materials and then breaking ground with the first uh, pilot projects. And then lastly, securing the long-term capital and operation maintenance funds. We also recommend a series of actions to implement this plan, whether physical, uh, whether programs or physical interventions. We'll discuss this more in detail. So as we go through the strategies and the programs, you'll notice at the top of the slide icons that indicate which goals the strategy helps achieve. Um, prioritizing equity, improving public health, jumpstarting local reinvestment, and increasing connectivity. I'll now pass this on to Catherine. Thanks, Daniela. These four strategies and programs are interrelated and may therefore have been grouped together. Better bus stops and green alleys are part of the greater goal for complete green streets. And our proposed environmental education program 
will have components that serve and contribute to these three strategies. Next. This image does a great job laying out each of the components we want in a complete green street. All pedestrian accommodating design, greened bus shelters, buffered bike lanes, designated vehicle lanes, gathering spaces and seating, plantings and street trees, and integrated stormwater management. Next. Derelict alleyways have the potential to become environmental and community serving assets through their transformation into green alleyways for stormwater management. This mechanism can help manage runoff volumes, improve safety in alleys, act as low speed connecting routes for pedestrians and bicyclists, accommodate parking, and can improve the sense of community and pride. Next. We're proposing the creation of a youth educational program known as the Patapsco Environmental Education Program and Symposium, or PEEPS. This initiative would leverage the existing environmental CTE program infrastructure at Benjamin Franklin High School at Masonville Cove. The program will create an educational component for several of this plan's recommendations and connect student-led research to those outcomes. The program will have a curriculum that aims to improve digital literacy through the use of GIS technologies. It will instruct students how to design research and allow students to conduct hands-on environmental fieldwork. Senior students will have the opportunity to present their research and projects to the community and the local policymakers at a yearly symposium. Locations for projects and research can line up with locations recommended in this plan. For example, a potential avenue for research and later implementation exists in the idea of constructing bee sanctuaries on bus shelters using native plantings for pollination and stormwater management. The PEEPS program will focus student efforts on community serving and environmentally based issues and allow them to take part in resolution of the issues. Now on to Luke who will dive deeper into our proposal for better bus stops. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so um, I'll, be, I'll be discussing our Better Bus Stop program in more detail. Um, this program could be implemented in sites uh, such as the one in Cherry Hill that Chris discussed. Uh, transit equity starts with bus stops. Data shows uh, that people with lower incomes, people of color, and people with disabilities are disproportionately bus riders. On average, waiting for the bus makes up 31% of bus riders' commute times. Uh, improving this experience with bus, with bus shelter treatments affords public health benefits by protecting riders from heat and other extreme weather. Research has shown that some degree of enclosure can also lower the perceived wait time for riders, enhancing their experience. Most of the bus stops uh, we observed amounted to simply a pole in the ground. Uh, they lacked seating or shelters. Uh, we found many bus stops that did not have sidewalk infrastructure or mid-block crossings to support return trips. Um, many are placed in locations where the line of sight is obstructed, uh, increasing the risk of collision for pedestrians trying to cross the street to get to the bus stop. Green infrastructure best management practices serve, uh, serve multiple purposes when integrated at bus stops. Uh, they provide drainage to ensure puddling of stormwater does not impede accessibility. They provide a physical buffer between traffic and pedestrians. They act as traffic calming elements and can shorten crossing distances between paired bus stops. Uh, furthermore, integrating green stormwater facilities is an opportunity to promote interagency coordination by leveraging complementary resources and tapping into new funding opportunities. Tactical urban projects uh, provide prototypes that are low cost, allowing the community to test improvements that can eventually become permanent. Uh, at the University of Arkansas, the Office of Sustainability piloted this approach uh, by installing these hand-painted tree stumps for seating at several bus stops uh, around the city of Fayetteville. Wood is a great material uh, as it's renewable, a natural insulator, uh, and in Baltimore there is the potential to partner with existing initiatives, which I will get to shortly. Not only is wood a good material for these uh, short-term tactical bus shelter amenities, it's also a great material for more permanent structures. 
a major component of this iterative delivery approach is using the demonstration and pilot sites as a focal point for community engagement by tying placemaking to participatory action. Uh, these sites will be equipped, uh, equipped uh, with a board, colorful sticky notes, and Sharpies. This creates a two-way communication channel that collects input and des on design and needs from the residents and riders, uh, as well as communication of upcoming installations. In terms of process, we envision maintaining a weekly cadence of analyzing input and updating these boards uh, and using a continuous improvement board to visually communicate this progress. Um, so the, in addition to the potential partnerships uh, listed here, I did want to highlight a potential partnership with the United States Forestry Service uh, in their Baltimore Wood Project. Uh, this would allow us to source these sustainable materials for the um, implementation, as well as furthering their mission to rethink uh, wood waste streams um, and provide more sustainable, you know, provide less waste in the city. I'll now turn it over to Maria to discuss the next set of programs. Thanks, Luke. These next five strategies and programs are also interrelated and must have been grouped together. Digital community hubs serve two purposes. First, first they provide internet hubs for the community, and second, offer immediate response to the city's digital divide by providing internet support to the other four programs seen here, which we will explain in this presentation. Next. As, pre as previously mentioned, there is a digital divide in these neighborhoods where access to broadband is only reported for approximately 57% of the middle branch households according to census data. This is likely attributed to problems with last mile connectivity, as well as cost oh. for both infrastructure and service. The last mile brings the connection to residents' home within the telephone exchange or through the cable company serving the area. Insufficient last mile connectivity reduces the reliability of existing broadband. However, innovative approaches such as deploying Wi-Fi enabled school buses as seen here in, these, in the photo, in residential neighborhoods have been shown to close that gap and provide digital equity. In addition to creating free Wi-Fi hotspots in residential areas that, la that lack strong broadband connect connectivity, these will also serve as community public spaces with dedicated programming to connect residents to three of our green initiatives mentioned just a minute ago. Namely, the SB7 in Demand, the Green Wellness Program, and the Healthy Home Weatherization. Has been forwarded to an automatic Although these programs stand on their own, the digital community hubs are, are a channel through which they can be facilitated. Next. The SB7 in Demand Program will support the existing workforce development programs offered by the city and other organizations by strengthening those connections to the SB7. The first goal of this program will be to help adult residents develop in-demand skills that will, help them, um, that will help make them competitive and diversify their skills in the changing job market. The second purpose will be to form partnerships for local hiring with future businesses in Port Covington once development resumes. Port Covington will become an important employment hub that presents an opportunity to tap into both local and first source hiring for higher wage jobs. Programming will focus on specific job sectors and start small to allow for an outcomes-based approach to make it eligible for innovative financing mechanisms such as impact investments from the private sector. The program will pilot upskilling and reskilling efforts around both IT sector jobs and green jobs. As such, the recommended first year program will offer a digital jobs track and a green jobs track. Next. These programs through the green wellness program 
contribute to health and wellness of the SB7 community. First, the large urban farm network in SB7 will provide residents additional opportunities in growing and receiving fresh produce. It is meant to further the goals of the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative and the Homegrown Baltimore Plan. Next, we have the Park and Produce Prescription Plan. Medical professionals prescribe their patients to get respite and other health benefits by visiting nature and parks. While the Produce Prescription Plan is geared towards developing a pilot with expectant mothers that can obtain local fresh produce as part of their coordinated prenatal care. I will now turn this back over to Shane to discuss the last two strategies. Many of the homes in the neighborhood are older and were built before current energy efficiency building standards, which has a disproportionate impact on low-income households who pay higher utility bills and spend significantly more on home maintenance and repair costs. The city of Baltimore already has a weatherization assistance program for low-income households. We recommend implementing an outreach campaign to generate community awareness of the program paired with an in-person application assistance located at the digital community hubs. We also propose that the city create a pilot weatherization program specifically for public housing properties, which are some of the least resilient structures facing impacts of climate change and most in need of green infrastructure upgrades. Next. The Middle Branch waterfront investment will inevitably drive up property values and rental costs, and with that comes the risk of displacement. We recommend taking a very proactive strategy to ensure long-term affordability and to ensure that the existing communities are the ultimate beneficiaries of the investment. We have a multifaceted strategy that weaves together several key issues. One, there's a high rate of vacant properties in the area, including underutilized vacant lots that have been demolished but are currently serving no community function, as well as a significant number of vacant housing units that need rehabilitation. And two, there is a strong need for mixed income affordable housing that can be guaranteed to stay affordable as the neighborhood benefits from the major investment coming to the waterfront. To achieve investment without displacement, we recommend taking advantage of some opportunities that already exist within the SB7 and the city of Baltimore. The community land trust model is a proven strategy that allows communities to take ownership of their neighborhood and ensures permanent affordability for both homeowners and renters. South Baltimore already has a community land trust that is currently working in Brooklyn and Curtis Bay and has potential to be expanded with adequate funding and support. The city of Baltimore recently established an affordable housing trust fund, which has funds available for existing community land trusts. We recommend making this area a priority for funding and assisting with the acquisition of vacant properties to be converted into affordable housing units as soon as possible before investment makes them unattainable. The easiest targets in the short term will likely be vacant buildings that can be quickly renovated and made available to tenants. For vacant demolished lots, we suggest a parallel long-term strategy that incorporates temporary alternative community uses for the land until it is eventually acquired by the trust and either made into a permanent fixture or converted to housing depending on the desires of the community. One temporary community use for vacant land would be a place for the digital community hubs that Maria discussed earlier. These temporary hubs that uh, could go up right away and eventually be transferred to a more permanent location once the South Baltimore Land Trust acquires enough funding for the land. We also identified several lots where a beneficial temporary use could be expanded outdoor seating for adjacent restaurants and bodegas. This would be a great use of space in the immediate short term and will help out small businesses who have been struggling during COVID with capacity limitations in their existing space. Finally, we recommend that the land trust utilize a beneficiary opportunity model to create a source of income perpetuity and help with long-term maintenance costs. This will help ensure the long-term sustainability of the community land trust model and allow them to provide ongoing infrastructure upgrades and maintain a quality stock of resilient house housing units long into the future. And uh, with that, I will hand it back over to Daniela to take us through funding and financing. Thanks, uh, next. So by now we can all picture the many benefits that green infrastructure affords, especially when introduced thoughtfully. However, without planning for maintenance and operations, 
uh, the benefits may not be long lasting. The solution to long-term maintenance costs is usually financing and most grants and loan programs only cover capital projects instead of the ongoing operations and maintenance costs. These costs can become a major burden on many communities with limited resources. If investments in green infrastructures aren't maintained, they don't meet their purpose and the community cannot fully benefit. Still, some communities are thinking creatively to solve this problem. Prince George's County Clean Water Partnership um, is a nationally recognized and groundbreaking public-private partnership, or PRE3. They use the EPA's community-based P3 contract model to leverage private sector dollars to support long-term and large-scale green infrastructure investment and their maintenance. This model is performance-based and includes stipulations that require 35% of contract work use Prince George's County contractors and job training for local youth, creating job and educational opportunities for the community. Next. So using the Prince George's uh, Clean Water Partnership and other case studies as inspiration, we developed the following roadmap to create a sustainable financing model for green infrastructure in the SB7. Our model attempts to phase different funding and financing mechanisms based on their level of stability, how quickly they can be activated or stood up, and their ability to support either a short-term action versus a long-term intervention. So traditionally, financing for green infrastructure comes from general funds. They, however, compete with other public services like schools for financial resources. Many grants are available at the federal and state level, but funds are often limited and severely competitive. Still, grants and general funds can be relatively accessible to begin initial construction on capital projects. You'll see in our report that each type of project has been paired with a specific um, or several specific grants to make them possible. Next. To create a more predictable funding stream, uh, the community can establish a beneficiary opportunity fund. Like Shane mentioned earlier, a fund like this operates like an endowment. It generates interest on the principal amount over time, creating a sustained source of income. The community can rely on the interest earned to fund the maintenance of early interventions created through the grants and public funds. Next. So both the environmental impact bonds and social impact bonds are pay for successfuls. The upfront capital is paid by a private investor, while a public entity and a private firm share the performance risks, rather than over overburdening uh, the city with a financial risk. Uh, impact investments like an environmental impact bond is also a way to provide financing for a future P3. Next. For the commercial areas, an infrastructure improvement district can be established. Here, a group of property owners share the cost of infrastructure improvements and maintenance. Most districts like this are meant to fund capital projects, but a community of stakeholders can develop it to be more like the common area maintenance fee, which can also support maintenance costs. Next. So when the Middle Branch waterfront is eventually developed, it will surely become a tourist attraction and destination. And managing parking in the area will become a priority. We see an opportunity to align transportation policy with green infrastructure through financing. In parking benefit districts, parking revenues are returned to the district funding transportation improvements, which in this case can include tree planting or bicycle facilities using green storm water best management practices. So instead of that money disappearing into a general fund, residents can see the tangible benefits of the parking revenue at work in their local community, which is why I coded it blue for high visibility projects. In terms of fiscal equity, a parking benefit district shifts the cost burden of maintenance away from the community and provides a way for visitors to pay into the infrastructure they use when visiting the waterfront. Next. So the city already has an established stormwater utility that is funded by property owners. Um, green stormwater projects can immediately tap into the stream of funding. Specifically, it provides a way to work with private property owners and incentivize the installation of green stormwater best management practices through the existing credit program, which grants them more control over this fee. Next. 
However, in the long term, we would want to supplement this funding source with something um, market-based to fill the cost gaps, like a P3. A longer term tool, as a longer term tool, we place the P3 at the long end of the spectrum, where it can support larger investments, as Chris mentioned earlier, after extensive community involvement and consensus, of course. Traditional P3s are created between a public entity and the private sector. However, P3s can also be structured to include the city partnering with a neighborhood organization or a local nonprofit that supports smaller scale projects and ensures strong community involvement from the get-go. Eventually, with substantial evidence and community consensus, several of the larger scale interventions will justify bringing in a private sector partner, especially when highly specialized technical expertise is required. Prior to establishing a P3, the city conduct meaningful community outreach to build consensus on the goals of the P3 and the contract agreement. These shared goals and agreements can generate um, and require investments back into the existing community, like local workforce training and hiring requirements. Next. So long term, the idea is not to phase out any of these, but to have a combination of market based and command economy tools working together. Next. Um, so although we uh, recommend establishing a community based P3 in the long term to support the larger projects, this is just one tool in the toolbox and a truly sustainable model would include the diversity that we um, just presented. I'll now turn it to Luke for the wrap up. Thanks. Uh, so this plan will allow the South Baltimore seven communities to use short term action and thoughtful implementation to bring about long term change. Green infrastructure and the related programs we're proposing can generate innumerable benefits for the community, especially in transportation, public health and energy efficiency. We hope that the communities can use this plan and build upon it to meet their evolving needs uh, by building engaged and interconnected neighborhoods, hopefully resulting in the agency to truly shape the future of their own places. Uh, thank you all for coming and a special thank you to those that met with us during this study. Uh, I'll turn it over to David to facilitate the Q&A. Thank you, Luke.